and then to uh, tonight's ARCV event. Um, just uh, before we all start, um, I want to show a hands-on, you know, who is, uh, this the first meetup that you've been to for ARCV? Okay, a lot of new faces. Um, how many of you are, in, like, you know, actively involved with augmented reality? Okay, uh, engineers? Okay, uh, students? Designers? Okay, yeah, fair amount, nice, nice. Very good. Uh, well, my name is Shang. I'm one of the co-organizers along with Anna Cho, as well as uh, Jesse in the back. Um, and I wanted to, uh, this is basically the schedule for today. Um, we typically do uh, Fireside Chat Plus panels, uh, but due to the diversity of actually our today's uh, speakers, we wanted to actually take the time to really give them you know, time to go into their respective backgrounds, their stories, as well as their unique insights. So it's a slightly you know, divergent from our typical format, but hopefully you guys will find it equally uh, rewarding. And um, so each of the Fireside Chats will be about uh, 30, 25 to 30 minutes long, including Q&A after each speaker. So uh, once you uh, hear their stories from me, I'm gonna give the floor over to you to talk about. Um, and uh, next one, next slide. So tonight's uh, sponsors are Epic, which is uh, Anna's company, UC Berkeley Extension, who Fred and Jen Nadej are back over there. So thank you very much for giving us the space. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and also Sturfy, which is uh, my company. Um, it stands for Street Surfing, and we're a Mopitas-based augmented reality computer vision startup that basically enables developers to do world-scale AR. Um, and then, of course, Jesse, who is in the back, a fantastic, a fantastic <coughs> AV guy. So if you guys have any podcasts, recordings, and stuff like that, he is the man to, to chat with. Right, so this is, this is basically what my company does. We do really quick localization on mobile phones at city scale. And once you know where the location is, you can start attaching point of interests, like Foursquare, or you can put like portals around the world essentially. And uh, like many startups here in the Valley, we are constantly hiring and we're hiring engineers, uh, computer vision scientists, and uh, Unity uh, interaction designers. So, cool. Thanks. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our first uh, speaker up, uh, Nicholas Buco. Can we give a round of applause for Nicholas? Uh, Nicholas is a director of engineering at AFWAL, where he is the architect of the company's computer vision, uh, technology, and products, which is pretty much all your products, actually. They all have computer vision. Uh, prior to AFWAL, he worked at Google as a staff software engineer and manager, leading teams at Google Photos to develop transformative product experiences using computer vision, and in pro Google Music to optimize prod uh, product latency and data infrastructure reliability. Uh, Nicholas holds a PhD in computer vision from UC San Diego. Thanks a lot, Nicholas. I think there's a mic behind you. If yeah. You know, I turn it on. <clears throat> there we go. We want the audience to hear you after all. <laughs> so, uh, actually, let's, oh, perfect, it's working. So before we dive into your background, I was wondering if you can tell the audience a little bit more about, actually, before we start, who has heard of AFWAL in this room? <laughs> Okay, so that's basically the equivalent to number of people who are working at AR. So that's actually a good sign. <laughs> but for the you know the rest of the group who does not know what AFWAL is, I was wondering you can tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. So AFWAL is an augmented reality technology company. We make AR computer vision technology for the phone that's in your pocket. Um, and when we were starting AFWAL, you know um, we have had this realization that you know the, the world was moving in this direction. I mean, um, virtual reality was becoming a thing and it, you know, it was really compelling, but you know, people want to be in the world and not just um, you know, in, in a room, basically. Um, and so you know, we could see that this was going to be a 
really big thing. And at the time, a lot of the investment and development was around new types of hardware. And what we really wanted to do was to start to create a technology and a product and a platform that could like literally reach everyone on the planet. Right. Um, you know, just Air Core, Air Kits, top the line phones. Well, remember this was even before the world the world had heard right. the words Air Core and mm -hmm. Air Kit, um, and so yeah, we definitely started with that vision, um, and so we started building out a, a technology stack that's kind of similar to those um, those systems, except that they you know we were really working on targeting lower end phones and that sort of thing, um, and. Through our iterations of development, we learned a lot about the difficulties of developing augmented reality software. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the I, I don't know how many of you have actually developed an AR app, but it's it's it has some unique challenges mm -hmm. compared to um, developing a normal application because you know your your computer when you're developing for iOS you have an iOS simulator mm -hmm. when you're developing for unity you have a, a unity sure. player but AR is a unique technology on mobile devices mm -hmm. and that is truly mobile only and a lot of the the development iteration cycles that you normally go through mm -hmm. are um, are really um, based on that kind of like try it out on your computer and mm -hmm. that just doesn't work very right. well in AR. And it's mobile only because it requires the camera. It requires a see. camera and a sensing stack and everything sure. else. And so, you know, when when we we started at Eighth Wall to develop our own kind of prototype apps mm -hmm. to see what developers were going through, we quickly realized that there were a bunch of development challenges that needed to be solved on top of just the core technology. Uh, and so we went through um, some iterations of, for example, building out an application that you could use to stream in real time mm -hmm. all of your sensor data to your Unity development environment so that you could do things like actually have a full augmented reality preview experience within your Unity editor. Right. And, um, you know, we, we did this and we, we thought, you know, this is going to solve all of the development problems. And sure enough, you know, developers love the, the eighth wall remote for Unity. But, um, you know, what we found was that even really great experiences sometimes don't get the reach that you would want them to have. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, one reason is that, you know, like AR Core and AR Kit have. Uh, a certain amount of availability, but another is just that for the types of applications we were seeing, there were um, it was it was a hard ask to get somebody to install an app. Right. And you know, looking around in the market, we really didn't see anything that was truly web based. And you know, um, we also saw some initial kind of proofs of concept that the web has actually come a long way in mm -hmm. you know the, the 20 or so years since uh, like it's more than that now um, right yeah and so we actually went through a, 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 a phase where we tried to take all of our technology that we built in the course of the company and actually get it running natively within the web browser mm -hmm. and so now our primary product that we uh, offer is an AR technology stack that runs in the browser that's on your right. phone and, we've and actually, seen uh, I want to pause on that for a moment yeah, because sure. it is extremely significant what you guys are doing. Um, so, how many of you have heard of Pokemon Go? Hopefully everybody in this room, right? And Pokemon Go exists as a Unity application on iOS as well as Android, but it requires the user to download an application. So now imagine you are able to get the Pokemon Go kind of effects, essentially, on a browser without, you know, Without downloading an app, you know, from an app store, you just go to a website to launch this experience. It opens up the doors uh, immensely in terms of distribution for content and application developers, as well as the number of people who can experience these kind of content. Yeah. So I want to pause on that because it was—it's you kind of gloss over, but it's so monumental. Yeah. Sorry. Please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, it, it was actually yeah, a, a, a real technical challenge, and I'm really proud of what the Chi team accomplished. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so that's what we do. We make it easy for developers to build and distribute AR apps that reach the maximum audience. Definitely, awesome. And I think we're gonna have a live demo later, actually, from uh, Rigel, so kind of stay tuned for that. Um, before we go further into if wall, I wanted to you know, put the focus more on you in terms of you know, your own background. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed that you have a PhD in cognitive science. Um, and uh, was that how your professional career started or did it start before that? And has it been a, you know, a straight journey or you know, kind of winded through a lot of different steps? You know, <clears throat> so when I, was, when I was trying to decide what to do with my life, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had, um, you know, I, I, was, I was really interested in a lot of humanities type things until I started taking computer science classes and realized that it was like, it was actually really fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there were, you know, a lot of, you know, popular, notable futurists who were talking about how AI was going to be this like thing that was going yeah. to take off and, um, you know, really revolutionize the world. And so I, I started volunteering in labs as an undergraduate in my computer science program mm -hmm. and um, doing some research there. And I was, uh, as I was deciding to go to grad school, I had to, you know, pick a, a, a school and a department. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I realized that if I was going to study mm -hmm. artificial intelligence and computer vision, I could either take electives that were operating systems mm -hmm. or uh, psychology and physiology and um, you know philosophy kind of things and that sounded like a lot more interesting of like <laughs> yeah. a second thing to study right. to me at the time and so that's how I wound up in a cognitive science department mm -hmm. doing very computer science and engineering related things right I see and um, I guess like what did you do after graduating from your PhD uh, so after I graduated my PhD, I went to Google and I worked okay. at Google for um, five years. And you know, I I, I think of it like I, I spent uh, you know five years doing a, a PhD in cognitive science, and right. then I went to Google and I yeah. was basically doing another PhD in What's like that? real real there? software development. Uh, well, I mean. Okay. I, I say that because you know every day I was I was learning new things that I, I would never have learned from school. It was sure. a, a very exciting place to work where mm -hmm. you have really uh, talented people all around you who are teaching you you know the secrets that they have unlocked over the last uh, you know course of the company, and that was a, a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. um, but at Google, you know, working on the photos team, for example, um, I, I did a lot of projects that would bring computer vision technology into a product. Mm -hmm. um, and so examples of this were detecting if you took several similar looking photos in a row and automatically turning them into an animated GIF right. uh, was one of those projects that we worked on. Um, did so, that ever become a product within Google? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. um, in fact, I, I don't know if you know Google Photos, but mm -hmm. like these, these products still exist today. You know, I just went on a hike yesterday, I took a, a photo of a beautiful nature scene and yeah. it made me this like artistic rendering ah, right. of that photo. That's the same technology stack that I built out with yeah. the team at Google Photos. So that must be really interesting to see, I guess, like, you know, something that you had a hand in making and being like used by literally millions of people. Yeah, definitely. How was that first feeling? <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it was really a, uh, um, a shocking thing to realize, mm -hmm. like, how, you know, I, I came into the middle of this amazing thing. Right. You know, just on my, on my first, you know, assignment at Google, you know, like the first time my code got pushed to production, right. you know, I, I was, <laughs> you know, fixing a bug that was seen by like several million people. Mm -hmm. And it was like really amazing to me that that could be a thing. You know, we did a we did a project on Google Photos that was a lot of work. It, it mm -hmm. took a, a team of maybe 20, 25 people, um, you know, maybe like eight weeks of hard work running up to the holidays where we basically created 
an, an algorithm to basically try to sift through your photos from the last year and mm -hmm. find things like, um, you know, people who you, you tagged, who had good facial expressions or like famous landmarks or interesting kind of things and try to really create um, a representation of the year and put it all together mm -hmm. in a, um, in a, a video, like a year-end video card that we, right. we sent out to our users. And you know, this ended up uh, reaching you know, many tens of millions of users. Oh, wow. okay. And so even though it was a hard project and it was a lot of work, yeah. it was so gratifying right. to come into the middle of something like that. It's one of these moments where it's like all that hard work kind of just makes it worth it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the, the interesting things about about what we do in, in Silicon Valley and in the, the software mm -hmm. industry that we really have a, an unmatched lever, right. like in the scale of human history. Definitely. And fast forwarding to you know, if well, how did you find yourself being one of the founding members of the company? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully you can tell that when I was at Google, mm -hmm. I enjoyed working at Google. It right. was a great yeah, place to sure. work. Um, and so when I was working on Google Photos, my manager at the time actually um, had left Google to go to Facebook, and he is now the CEO of Eighth Wall. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, yeah. and so he came, you know, he emailed me, messaged me one day, I said like, yeah. hey, I'm starting a company, you should join my company. And I said, Eric, I really love working <laughs> with you. You're like, you know, it was one of the best experiences of my life. I'm really happy at Google. Right. And yeah. so he said, okay. And then a couple months later, he said, all right, well, we got funding for the company. I really want you to come <laughs> to the company. And I said, but Eric, I really love working at Google. Um, but over time, he, he convinced me that, mm -hmm. you know, we could build the thing that re reaches millions of people mm -hmm. instead of coming into the middle of that thing. No, definitely. And you guys are already on like kind of a, a good trajectory in order to reach that. And when you came on, were you, um, I guess like, were you tasked with building the engineering team from the ground up? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I was, you know, really initially tasked with technology development. I and see. so developing the technology, but also recruiting and mm -hmm. also, you know, going out and, and speaking to people about what we do right. and also working with uh, our, our customers and trying mm -hmm. to help them out. Yeah. And, you know, as, as the team grew, you know, running projects and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so, sure. um, yeah, it's when you're when you are, are starting out as a company, you know, you, you have to grow within the limits of what you mm -hmm. have available to you. Right, and I think uh, Rigel mentioned earlier, you guys are a small team and everybody takes a lot of different hats, right? And it's, uh, yeah, it seems for sure. like you've already described like four different kind of sides of what you do. Yeah. Um, and um, what exactly does your day look like? What are some of the you know, most rewarding parts? What are the most challenging parts of that? Um, you know, it, it really changes by the week. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and, and really, you know, as, as we go through different cycles and phases of the company, mm -hmm. it's like, what is really the most important thing right. to, to grow the company at this point? What, what is the most significant challenge to our users? What mm -hmm. is going to help enable new products to be built? Uh, and really, what is, is the challenge of the day? How many mm -hmm. people does it take? And, and so on. Um, and so, you know, one month I might be like mostly looking at spreadsheets of tasks that need to get done <laughs> and who's responsible for them and that sort of thing. And another, another day I might be, you know, looking at, you know, just spots on a, a visualization and my computer vision algorithm trying to like, Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so yeah, it, it really varies. Mm -hmm. Were there any, I guess like, you know, during your uh, multi-year journey with uh, AFOL, were there any kind of like, you know, oh shit moments <laughs> that either released with a major bug got pushed or any of these kind of like firefighting kind of things that you can share? Um, and how you guys dealt, dealt with that? You know, um, 
Not too many that I can think of. Okay, that's actually a really you're probably doing a really good job. Actually, right, you detect I mean, it's that. it's it's really a, a, a testament to the, right. the the strength of the team that we've built. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a it's a small team, but it's a strong team. Right. And uh, earlier you mentioned how you know in terms of web AR, there's a lot of challenges uh, in terms of you know slam and tracking and getting everything down. Um, can you go into a little bit more about the challenges of web AR compared to, let's say, Unity based, you know, using AR Kit or AR Core? Sure. So, um, you know, like the 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 world is amazing in what it gives to you. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you know about Mscripten, which is a C++ compiler, mm -hmm. which basically takes your C++ code and turns it into either um, ASM.js or, uh, or Wasm. And so, you know, we're really already starting out like at, at a pretty mm -hmm. high level. But, you know, even, even with that, you're not running at the same speed that you would on a, a mobile, uh, like, you know, just in, in the operating system. Mm -hmm. You don't have multiple threads available to you in a way that right. is convenient or usable. Um, you don't have um, access to things like um, the, the hardware instruction set that you might use to do things like optimized vector operations or mm -hmm. something like that. And so even though we had spent a lot of time really like tuning and hammering at our algorithm to get it as fast as possible, we found that we still needed to speed it up uh, like a considerable amount. And right. so you know, there was just a phase as we were doing this project of making sure that every line of code was instrumented, mm -hmm. seeing where all of the bottlenecks were, and really trying to, to get them you know, to, to the lowest level possible, and it still wasn't fast enough. And right. so then you have to look into, you know, okay, well, I, I don't have multiple threads in a web browser, and so how am I, I going to basically trick my system into doing multiple mm -hmm. threaded processing? And it turns out you have a whole separate GPU available to you. Right. And so then it's like, how can I just move everything that I can to the GPU just to kind of get that kind of like TikTok sort of, um, you know, one thing is processing while another mm -hmm. thing is processing. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a graphics background, and so right. I, I learned a tremendous amount about how OpenGL works, and mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, yeah, it, it was really challenging and really rewarding. No, definitely. And um, do you think that Google or Apple would ever try to copy your features and go, you know, more towards the web AR parts? You know, any thoughts around that, how it, in terms of defensibility as well? You know, I, I have learned to not try to speculate too much about what Google and Apple will do. Sure. They, they yeah. will do what they will do. Um, right. And so, you know, I, I think what we are, are thinking about is really, in addition to the core technology, sort of how to, like, what, what are the things outside of the technology that are barriers to adoption? I mean, Rigel will tell you about mm -hmm. things like um, developing different kind of, um, I guess product idioms that um, you know show the way for other people to develop rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I talked a little bit about um, tools for development and how to to optimize that. There's a whole extra set of problems that we found around um, how to maximize your reach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in in a world where you really have an application that's mobile only, if someone sends a link to their friend who is sitting at their desktop at work, mm -hmm. how do they open that link on their right, yeah. mobile device? And so we actually have put a lot of uh, thought into mm -hmm. this and you know, we have developed custom embed code that our, our partners can use to basically, when you click on the link from a desktop, it actually gives you a, a really short link you can type in on your phone or a QR code that you can scan. Mm -hmm. And whenever you go to a, like one of our websites on a, a desktop browser, it will give you the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so you know, just really trying to um, to solve those ancillary use cases right. that you find that are really the barriers to adoption for this technology. Mm -hmm. And given that, you know, uh, AFWAL is already on its 11th uh, release, it, it sounds like, you know, you are having a lot, a very, you know, close ear with the users as well and, you know, getting that user feedback in very quickly. 
as quickly as we can. Right, exactly. And um, you know, how do you see the future of AFWOL unfolding? What are like kind of the best or reasonable or worst scenarios that you can think of? <laughs> you know, it, it's an interesting world that we're headed into where, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the world, like, you know, I, I remember a, a time in, in computing where, um, you know, there were different form factors for things like joysticks and that sort of thing for, for games, where yeah. basically, you know, one of the first amazing games I played was uh, Mech Warrior, and I, like, mm. had to have, like, a right. fancy, like, flight stick and, like, yeah. this, like, 100 key kind of thing to, uh, to actually, like, navigate this thing. And I think there was a lot of, like, experimentation that eventually led to a unification around, mm -hmm. you know, the, the idioms of user input for computing as we know it today. Right. And I think we're actually headed toward, an, you know, another phase of nobody really knows what the right thing is going to be going forward for how to have content that lives on your computer and on your phone and on your headset mm -hmm. that you interact with physically through different, you know, either, you know, it's like you do have a, a button or a controller. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you, um, how much you follow the, the WebXR standards committee, but mm -hmm. actually one of the, the problems that they're trying to address is how you handle a multitude of different types of input devices yeah. in a, a world that spans VR and AR and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the, the challenges going forward are really how do we um, make it possible or feasible for a developer to to not have to go against the full cross product space of you know devices and so on you know really all they want is to get their content to their users mm -hmm. and so um, you know like helping developers navigate this space and making it super easy for them to just get experiences out into the world right that would be basically the mission of a accomplished, if you're able to do that. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, so that was actually my last question. I want to uh, open up the, the floor for questions. Anybody there? Okay, over there. Yeah, uh, really cool. Um, didn't know anything about it. Uh, questions about uh, getting into UI kit or do anything that actually runs in devices. Uh, do you expect this can work almost the same in devices that wrapped in a like UI kit, uh, so, so the question is, uh, how how does this work in in UI kit and and web kit? Um, so, I mean, UI kit is Apple's um, uh, idioms for basically developing applications, and you know, one of the, one of the actual sea changes we've seen in application development recently is a lot of developers are targeting things like React Native as a way to bridge the gap between um, between Android and iOS in terms of um, idioms for application development. But, you know, well, I guess my question is, uh, do you expect the same thing that you can do for mobile web with this to work native? Uh, if you want to have an application that, that had shared the same stuff with, with that working though, because I, I didn't... Mm. Could you run I, it in a UI view? Yeah, because I don't see it, React yeah. Native is my thought, but I don't see this in React Native, which is why I thought maybe UI view might hold it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I've actually been um, talking to and, and working with a, a team at Mozilla who is actually trying to figure out how to bring um, like AR kit type stuff into a web view as like a prototype for WebXR. And so um, there are some interesting challenges there, but um, definitely there are some solutions that we're looking at. So I, I mean, to, to be, like the, the, the main challenge is how do you serialize a camera frame at a reasonable resolution across the boundary between native and JavaScript, or how do you render it in a native way in order to um, keep it in sync with what's being rendered in the browser? Um, the latter being a much more like challenging coordination problem, the former being a much more challenging like serialization and processing problem. Mm -hmm. Sounds like your feedback is a, or your question is a bit of a feedback actually as well. So yeah, uh, I saw a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've used your stuff and 
how to compare it across different um, AI frameworks because we were actually asked to develop an uh, AI app for an iPod Touch, which is really a stupid idea. But we had to <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it does work, but you know, it's what what I want to ask is, I guess, is a broader sort of strategic question. Like, well, I like what you're doing and trying to make accessibility, but I can see you're sort of going to be hampered by not having access to the calibration of devices. So the reason why our kit's so good is because Apple control right. all, the, all the different calibrations in there from the sensors to the optics, <coughs> everything. So they can do that. Uh, that's why Google struggled with AR Corp to catch up because you know, they don't have the calibrations, they have to calibrate each phone independently. Um, how would you, uh, not having access to the metal, try and catch up to those guys? In terms of the quality of the uh, you know, localization around the brain and so on. Yeah, so I mean, the, the question is, you know, like, given the somewhat unlevel playing field between uh, hardware manufacturers and, and us being a, a software shop, how do we deal with that? And, you know, the, the answer is just with hard work and creativity. Um, you know, for example, there are ways to try to estimate the calibration of a device while you are running your algorithm. Uh, and so that's one way to do it. We also pre-calibrate a whole bunch of devices and ship those calibration parameters as part of our SDK for the devices that we see most commonly used. Question? Yeah. Uh, just checking your website out. I noticed you guys have like stuff for Unity and web. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, from business side, what are the most developers coming from? Are they wanting Unity or they are wanting web? And uh, what about are people asking for native solutions? The answer is all of the above. What's the numbers like? I don't, I don't know if I want to say the actual breakdown or like even actually know it as of today. So I, I don't want to give you a wrong answer for sure. Um, but you know, just as a, um, you know, if you if you go on our our developer Slack channel, you probably see maybe slightly more questions about web, but also like a, a sizable number of questions about Unity. And definitely, um, you know, they, we have had conversations with many different partners about uh, licensing our, um, our native, like just core library. So we've got time for a little more, yeah. Yeah, are there any sweet spot use cases where you're finding people are really starting to make money with the use of your technology? Um, yes. It sounds like <laughs> but, uh, Rigel, Rigel has a, an answer that he wants to give you, and I'll let him do that when his turn comes. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely remember that. Sure. Yeah, okay, I guess one more. Audio. Sorry. Could you, could you talk about how you um, provision audio services for different kinds of functionality? So, you know. Um, I'm not, the, the question is how, how do we provision audio services for, for different kind of functionality? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there beyond, you know, we, we kind of um, try to separate the computer vision and technology from the rendering system and also the audio system being a part of the rendering system. Just so, you know, if you have a framework for do, drawing your 3D objects, you probably also have a, a framework for either um, playing audio, rendering it in 3D spots and that sort of thing. And those problems decouple from the computer vision technology, which is essentially giving you, a, like taking over control of a virtual camera, positioning you in space, figuring out where things are relative to you in that space. And basically, you can think of it as providing a level of information to the application that you then bridge to other application frameworks in order to take advantage of those kind of things. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Yeah. Next up, we have uh, Rigel. Rigel, I think you're going to be setting up the uh, computer first, yeah, right? Yeah. For a demo? Yeah, cool. Sure. So while he's setting that up, I will uh, introduce you. So Rigel Benton is an interaction designer with uh, AFWall. Previously, Rigel worked as a cinematographer um, before transitioning AR, VR development, creating experiences for clients like Salesforce, 
Warner Brothers, and Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, he also designed Planar, uh, an AR app for measurements. Uh, Rigel holds a degree in radio, television, film from Uni University of Texas at Austin. Please give a warm welcome to Rigel. Direct. Cool. Do you wanna? So. Yeah, Mike. Oh, it's gonna be a little hard to. Here, there's a guy. I'll hold it for you. <laughs> All right. Let's see if the if the audio is working here. This is a website. They call me Genie, the alien robot hologram. Because you've called upon me, I will grant you one of these three specific wishes. You may choose between $1 million to live forever or to travel back in time. The choice is permanent, so choose wisely. There are literally no do-overs. Well, unless you reload the page. Excellent wish. Here's a cool million. Woohoo! Make it rain. You know what's even better than a million dollars? 30 billion. With a B. Genie coin. This is a sound financial decision. Just wait until the ICO. <laughs> it has been a pleasure making your wildest dreams come true. Until next time. So, yeah, so this was the very first demo that we ever released showing off web um, back in September of last year. And um, a few interesting things about this. This is the first thing I ever made with A-Frame. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, also, you'll notice this is just Safari and iOS. There's no special browser. There's no like hooking things up that don't exist outside of normal browsing environment. Um, now, basically what's happening is when the page loads, there's a script tag in the head of the document. And that pulls down our entire library. And it's about one megabyte in size and it processes all of the frames locally on device, so there's no cloud streaming. You can have a very slow internet connection and this still work, right? Um, so this character is, uh, I get a question a lot about like file sizes, right? Like downloading all of this data must be like really difficult, right? Because like apps are big and websites can't be. So, uh, so this character's name's Genie. He's kind of like our unofficial mascot. Or maybe he's our official mascot at this point. Uh, and, uh, and what you're looking at is a GLB file, which is a, it's the binary version of a GLTF. And uh, he's about four megs in size. And he has, uh, as you can see here, high resolution uh, PBR materials, right? He's got a real time reflection uh, probe that's reflecting back uh, different parts of his body. And, uh, and we also have this like BB 8 style locomotion system that we picked mm -hmm. up. Um, where he can move around. Yeah, it's really high fidelity for just a couple megs. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, and we also have, you know, the ability to like change his pose, his little Easter egg we added a week later, which also brings up this other interesting thing, which is uh, update cycles, right? So with apps, you have to push updates, people have to approve those updates, people have to download those updates. With this, you push it to your server, the next time that everybody reloads the page, or whenever they do that, they get the latest update, right? So. Um, you know, development cycles like this. I wouldn't have been able to build this as an app as quickly as we right. did because of how many updates we were making, as well as um, you know, this just being CSS and HTML, right? And talking about how easy UI is on the web. There's like decades of uh, frameworks that have been built, so uh, to make this sort of thing really easy and rapid performance. Also, yes. responsive web, right? It's like great and super easy to like how to work on all these different screen size and variants. Landscape mode is like automatic. Yeah. Right? So anyway, yeah. So to start with this, just to give you guys a sense of no, very cool. What it's all about. Like I said, AR is a very visual medium, so we kind of have to do it, you know, basically a demo beforehand. So yeah. here you go. There you go. Take a seat. And uh, before we dive a bit more into, um, you know, your background. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the main hat that you wear at AFWAL? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Role. So, uh, so AFWAL is 12 people. Um, it's been 12 people for 
a minute now. And, uh, you know, I came on, I think I was like employee number 10 or something. Um, and, uh, and I came with a lot of energy and a lot of wanting to just make us the biggest thing in the world as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So in addition to actually making like this demo, uh, among many others uh, that we see publicly, um, I make lots of videos for us, which makes sense given my background. Um, prior to tech, and then uh, additionally, you know, I, uh, I interface a lot with our agencies, so I've become sort of our in-house creative consultant for many of these um, agencies that are trying to understand the ins and outs of web AR, how that differs from mobile AR, um, and uh, headset VR. Mm -hmm. And uh, web is this interesting thing where most of the people that come into it are coming from Unity. They're not coming from web tech backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, helping them, you know, understand that their art pipeline isn't all that different, right, than like a typical game design um, or, you know, game art pipeline. And, uh, and then helping them, you know, basically solve for these uh, really early gotchas that we figured out through development of Genie through UX, making it really easy for people to understand, um, you know, using our technology, how to build like the most compelling and easiest mm -hmm. to understand products, right, or projects. Definitely. Yeah, um, and we're definitely going to get a lot more into that. Um, but I want to uh, the audience to a little bit understand your background first. And so you mentioned that you had a uh, film background, right? Mm -hmm. Radio, television, and and film. Yeah. You, uh, is that how your professional, I guess, like career started? What yeah. Did, where did that lead you to, and how did it lead you to a wall? Totally. Yeah. So I only ever wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Right. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, was, I was making movies before college, um, mm -hmm. and not just like backyard stuff. I worked on shows like NBC's Revolution uh, in the G&E department. I was assistant camera operator on shows like Storage Wars Texas, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Wait, Storage Wars yeah. Texas? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> Storage... right. in, in 15 seconds, can you describe what that is? I, can't, I just can't let that go. These, uh, <laughs> These these old, you know larger than life characters. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, they 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 do blind bidding on abandoned storage units in the most uh, you know disparate parts of Texas, which uh, right. can Texas is very large. Um, you know you can you can go like ten hours in every direction and still be in Texas. Um, and so it's very hot and gross outside, <laughs> and uh, you know you're not cold and gross like San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you're doing you're doing things like um, you know instead of using the bolt cutters, which is more efficient uh, and mm -hmm. easier to carry around, you have to run you know an extension cable so that you can use the grinder because the grinder has sparks, and right. the sparks are way better for the for the TV cameras. Um, so mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and also be shot on tape, and it was it was an absurd time in my life. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. But it led me here, so uh, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I would keep. And going. how how did it lead you here? <laughs> Great question. Yes. Um, so yeah. So after doing that for a while, I was like, you know, my parents were like, you have to go to college, and I was like, all right, <laughs> I'll go to college, but I'm studying film, and um, and right. so. At, at UT in Austin, um, you know, Austin's kind of known for this like rebel filmmaker attitude, right? So like Robert Rodriguez uh, was, says, you know, went to the same school as me and uh, mm -hmm. Matthew McConaughey. And, and so they all have this kind of like, you know, we're just gonna do it, right? right. And so, you know, the first lesson I learned was like, how do you make a movie any way you can? You no know, budget. <laughs> yeah, no budget, you know, like, uh, you know, please, please tell the police before you start waving guns around <laughs> in stores. Uh, you know that sort of thing. So, uh, um, but yeah, you know, I used to I used to joke about like how the radio, television, film program, uh, my degree, RTF, it's the three dead technologies, right? It's like they've all been replaced by something. Um, so right out right out of the gate, you know, it's kind of an obsolete field. Um, mm -hmm. But it's one that everyone that was involved and in still is like very passionate about. Um, but I guess the thing here is that like. You know, it's not just a, it's not a passion about a particular medium. It's a passion about what that medium can do, right? And that's, that's the thing that's carried me through, um, through all these different things that I've done, uh, is that I love affecting people in positive ways. And, um, and I would say that, like, 
the same, the, the goosebumps that I get when I hear people in a dark room gasp or laugh at something that I've made on screen, mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten that tenfold right. with the opportunities I've had at Eighth Wall to be able to watch people and just experience through them like sheer joy uh, using things uh, in AR. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, really what happened was I was, um, you know, shooting music videos and commercials and stuff towards the end of uh, college. I was graduating, I had a feature lined up, and um, I had recently shot a film that won the um, best, uh, best short film competition at Cannes in, in oh, France. Nice. Wow, and, that's, um, and that's I was, quite an accomplishment. <laughs> I was getting, yeah, I was getting a lot of, I was like, I had my whole life planned out, essentially. Yeah. And, um, 